as Wendy said, I teach over at UNMC part-time and I'm also in the clinic part-time, okay? So that means that I am um, certified as a family um, nurse practitioner. And so I do see my own clients, um, but then I teach on the side. And when I got my degree for my doctorate, I had to pick a project. I had to do some research. And this was fascinating to me. Addiction in itself is fascinating, but this came and it was new. It was something that not a lot of people knew about at the time. Um, and so I've been kind of doing research since these came around, which is kind of cool, okay? Um, heads up, I love data, so I may throw some numbers at you, not to freak you out, but I'll walk you down the trail. So if I get too much or um, you guys have any questions at any time, feel free to stop me. I want this to be a little bit more conversational than it is absolutely 100% lecture, okay? All right, so let's go back to what is vaping, and there's gonna be a lot of terms when it comes to vaping, but I wanna bring us back to the original term that came, and that was the electronic cigarette, okay? And so what the CDC defines electronic cigarette is that it's in a device, um, and it's used to produce an aerosol, usually containing nicotine. Um, once that produces that aerosol, someone breathes it in, and that's, a, that's the definition of the electronic cigarette. Okay, so use that going forward. Background though, this is where it starts to get a little interesting, is that it was developed in Beijing, China in 2003, and it took the Chinese by a stronghold and it really started to penetrate their population and became really prevalent. And so it was in 2019 when they started being like, this is too much, too many people are using this. Um, and so they banned online sales but it wasn't until 2022 when they said we need more regulations and so they started banning the extra flavors down to tobacco, okay? Well, in 2006, back that up a little bit, um, that's when it came to the United States. And the Chinese government, they said, man, this is really penetrating our population. Well, that was at 1.5% of the population. It hit the United States and penetrated the population by 30%. Okay, so that's a lot more than what it did over in China. Um, but our government still didn't put any regulations on it at first, um, which we'll talk about regulations here in a little bit. Um, but today, what e-cigarettes consist of, there's so many different names for it, right? There's vaping, there's e-cigs, um, there's mods, there's pods, there's Juul, there's tank systems, there's so many different names that it goes by now. And it's gone through several different generations. We're on the fourth type of e-cigarettes out there, okay? So breaking down that e-cigarette, this is an example of the first traditional one that came to the United States, okay? And as you can see, it has several parts. On the tip, that far end, there's gonna be a light emitting diode, so it's kind of a cool little light that lights up when someone breathes in and simulates a cigarette, okay? Um, not much to that, but the next thing is that battery. Moving up a little bit, we have a heating element and a microprocessor which are connected to the vape juice, which allows it to um, break it down into an aerosol. And then that top end there is going to be the mouthpiece for which it's breathed in, okay? Like I said, it went into several generations. So it's transitioned from that one I just showed all the way over to this pod base, which looks like a USB. Um, and so that's really changed. But with those changes have also come different adaptations and customizations. Um, so we started out that first one, it was pretty much disposable, okay? It was a one-time use, throw away, or it maybe would last a day, throw it away. Then we changed, the variation of vape pen kind of go together where it starts to be a little bit um, different as far as appearance, becomes more of like an e-hookah. Um, it becomes to have a little bit more of a change as far as being refillable or maybe even rechargeable. We then changed to the mods which those are, there's going to be several modifications done to it, which is why mods, right? So that one, there's, again, it's rechargeable, refillable. Hey, this is neat, right? You don't have that traditional tobacco smell. Um, I don't have to smell like a smoker anymore. It's a pretty cool thing. Um, it was also marketed as harmless water vapor, saying there's nothing wrong with breathing this in. It's not gonna cause you any problems. It's safe. And then they said, hey, this is a great way to stop smoking. Use this instead. And here's actually an ad that came out, and I don't know if anyone remembers this, um, but it was for the blue e-cig. And what it was is it was saying, why quit? Quitting isn't good. Like, no one likes a quitter. 
come to this, this is safe, okay? People listen to that, and there was a change then in that implementation in the population, and that stuck around, okay? Some people still believe that, and this data was actually gathered in 2021 by the CDC, and as you can see, there's quite a bit of the population, all age ranges, that use vapes, okay? Um, the scary thing about that is look at that highest prevalence rate. These tall towers, let's see if that shows, right there. And look at those age range, 18 to 24. What's college age? About 18 to 24, traditionally, right? So this is a big population and that's scary because you're still growing at this point in time, you're still maturing, things are still happening um, to, re to achieve that adult body, okay? So why are we here today? Why are we talking about it? Why are those misconceptions? We've heard a little bit already, but I'm gonna break it down even further. So let's go back to the mechanism itself, okay? That nice pen looking thing. Um, when it breaks down to that aerosol, there was a battery in there, right? There was a microchip, there was a processor, and what those things have in them are harmful elements, okay? Would you normally wanna eat a battery? No, please don't, <laughs> please don't. Anna and I say no, okay? Um, so harmful elements, and it's not only in the liquid itself, okay? We're outside the liquid at this point, and it's just the mechanism. Okay. It puts harmful elements into the aerosol. Along with that, so some of those harmful elements, I don't know if anyone likes chemistry or chemistry buff, but diethylene glycol, heavy metals, do those sound like good things for the body? No. We were always taught like carrots, veggies, fruit, right? I don't think that falls in there. Um, then along with that, trace, uh, trace metals are getting put into that aerosol by just how it breaks down that liquid and produces it into that aerosol, okay? So trace metals, see if you recognize any. Nickel, chromium, cadmium, tin, aluminum, and lead. That's all being found in that aerosol and what people are breathing in. I think that can cause a problem. Along with that, fatal conditions have, have increased, such as um, cancers for the lung, sinonasal, which sinuses and nasal cavity, um, as well as mouth cancers, oral cancers. All of those numbers have gone up, especially for those using vapes. And a lot of that is most likely triggered to those harmful elements in the breakdown of the processing. Some increased incidents. I have some great pictures. Hope no one is queasy at things. I love those gross images. Um, I'm getting a few looks already. <laughs> but what it does is it increases the incidence for heart problems, kidney problems, lung problems. Those do not look like good lungs, FYI. Okay, it also has an increased risk of changing psychology. First of all, having an addiction and adding a stimulant to it is never a good combination. Okay, so we have some uncontrolled psychoses out there because of this as well. Not to mention, um, the rates of diabetes goes up and a lot of that time it's because of the issues and the microvasculature, so all those small blood vessels, um, it starts to work on them and that changes our anatomy. That changes how we process things as well. So the incidence rates of diabetics are way up in those who vape. Okay. Not to mention all these other fun pictures of the device actually exploding. Okay, So burn injuries, you can see on the tips of the finger, went up at the face, as well as in the hand. And I have some more fun ones of when it's not even in use and it's in someone's pocket. Okay. It explodes, it's a battery. Batteries can do that, batteries can combust. And in this case, it definitely did. All right, now that's the mechanism. We're gonna go on to the e-liquids and the danger of that. And here's where I get into my data, so sorry, I love those numbers. But these e-liquids, people started breaking those down, all right? When they came in 2006, they were pretty colors, they were fun flavors, and as you can see, I don't know about you, but bazooka sour straws, they are delicious. Okay, not nutritious, but delicious. All right, and if that's a flavor, that's pretty tempting. And that's why it was so easily marketable towards younger adults, because they're like, well, that tastes great. I want that. Um, same with these packaging, such as Sorbet Pop. Actually, that one's still on the market, just so you know. 
Um, there's Mango Bomb. There's another one up top there. And they look cool. That's what they're marketing. But when we start breaking down what's actually in them, the concentrations of nicotine alone, now you can put other things in these vapes, that's another talk. But we're gonna focus on the nicotine aspect, okay? These concentrations, the bazooka, has 300 milligrams of um, nicotine per 200 mils of solution, okay? You break that down, do the math, that's about 1.5 milligrams of nicotine per mil, okay? Now, in a traditional cigarette, when you compare that 1.5, a traditional cigarette is between 10 to 12 milligrams. You're like, wow, that's low. That's not too bad. Okay. Moving on to the next one, Tribeca. So that one has 6 milligrams per mil, and in this vial, there are 30 mils. Okay. Again, this equates to about 18 cigarettes. Not bad. There's 20 cigarettes in a traditional pack. Okay. Just in case you're not a smoker, here you go. All right, so use that in comparison, 18 to 20, still not that bad. However, when actual research was done based on the concentrations, they found that these concentrations ranged from anywhere from 14.8 to 87.2 milligrams per mil. Is that close to that 1.5 or that 6? Absolutely not. Um, so that's, that's a lot of nicotine in there. And nicotine can be overdosed. And actually, that was happening a lot more when these came out because people were mistaking these for liquid candy, mistaking them for eye drops or ear drops, and a lot of overdose actually occurred, whether it be for older adults, children, someone just mistaking because they didn't have their glasses on, there was overdose, okay? When we look more at the concentrations of things, and I apologize, I'm gonna read these numbers off, okay? I did not memorize them. So one mil of vaping liquid should last between 500 and 600 puffs, okay? The average puffs a day are 200 for an e-cigarette. But the scary thing is, is no definition is given on what a puff is, okay? With a traditional cigarette, you have one cigarette, right? It burns, it's done. What stops someone from smoking an entire vape? What stops someone at that one mil? Their cartridge runs out? You don't know how much they're getting in that one dose, along with the changes in battery, right? The power changes the amount administered to that patient too, okay? So that gets a little scarier. And in one study, there was 3,000 milligrams of nicotine found in one mil. Crazy, right? Definitely not that six, definitely not that 1.5. So, When they've made their adjustments over time, like I said, this is the strongest on the market. Here's where we're sitting at today. That was the beginning, here is now. The Juul Pod, which is the strongest, was 59 milligrams per mil, okay? It's getting a little bit more figured out, a little bit. And when they did that regulation, we thought that things would change, things would get better. Everything was great. So when 2016 came around and the FDA started regulating, we were all pretty excited about it. That regulation included they had to be 20 years of, 21 years of age or older to buy and use. Um, limited flavors. They took away like that bazooka sour straw. Like I said, that mango pop was still there. Those sorbet flavors, still there. Um, and there was regulations on some concentrations, okay, saying you can't have 3,000 milligrams per mil. I'm glad that that happened. However, the FDA implemented these regulations 10 years after they had been introduced, right? So for 10 years, all these products were on the market. When the FDA asked for all those regulations to present to meet these regulations, about 926,000 products were taken off the shelves. That's 926 product, 926,000 products that lived in everyone's lives for about a decade. There are some diseases after that, for sure, okay? And we thought maybe those regulations would fix everything. However, data shows that between January 2017 and September 2022, so just a little less or a little over a year ago, the volume of those e-cigs changed and increased 518%. That's a big jump. And the average nicotine also increased from
from 1.7 to that 5% of that joule mod. It's a big jump, big jump. So we're still going in the opposite direction of safe. Remember when they said this is a great tool to stop smoking? What are we thinking now? Is that a great tool? All right, so why does it matter to you? Well, the American, and I'm gonna get this wrong, American College Health Association, they did a survey for UNK, all right? And in that survey, 353 students responded, and out of those 353, 100 students say, I use a substance. And out of those numbers, 84% said, I vape. That's a big chunk, okay? Of those, 75% said they were female, 20% identified as male, and 5% transgender or non-conforming. Here's a scarier statistic. These students have tried, either tried to quit and failed, or have not tried at all. So of those 100, 100 individuals, 14.6% 14 have cut down or failed to cut down in the last three months, and 16.3, opposite, not in the last three months, 16.7% have tried to cut down in the last three months. But the scariest number is that 68.7% have never tried, meaning they don't think there's a problem. There's not an issue, okay? So let me tell you the issue. Here's your risk. Your risk is what's called EVALI, e-cigarette or vaping associated pulmonary injury. That's a scary term. Okay. And what's even scarier is that all the data we have on this is that we have to rule out everything else, every cold, every flu, every cancer, every fungal infection before we can say this is because of your e-cigarette. This is because of your vaping. So therefore those numbers, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work to get to that point where we can say 100% this is because you are vaping and a lot aren't gonna chase it that far. A lot are gonna say, eh, we're good. I'm gonna treat you for what you got and move on. Um, it's probably because of this, but I can't say 100%. Here's why, it's because they have not ruled and gone through all those channels, which can be quite costly. As of February 18, 2020, 2,807 hospitalized Valley cases. Like I said, those are the ones that have been excluded. Those are the ones that they have gone that far to say this is because of vaping. Think of how many are up there that are treated elseways and never, never gone to that length of diagnosis. Okay, that's probably, a, that number's probably a lot more than it actually has been reported. In all 50 states, there has been deaths. 68 deaths have been confirmed related to vaping. Again, that number's low, but who is going to chase it all the way to that end? Not a bunch, okay? Especially if they don't know about it too much, about Evali and vaping, since it's a newer thing. Um, things like pneumonia, bronchitis, cancers, those have been around for a long time. This, remember, came here 2006. That's pretty recent. And those symptoms, that, diagnos that diagnosis of exclusion, these symptoms, look up here. I'm gonna interpret some of my medical terms, okay? So tachycardia, fast heart rate. Tachypnea, fast breathing. Pulse oximetry, so how much oxygen is in your blood? Less than 95%, okay? For reference, we don't put oxygen on anyone until they're in their 80s, okay? 89% will put oxygen on you, but there's people walking around in the campus that breathe this every day. A cough who's had a respiratory illness recently, cough. Dyspnea, shortness of breath, a little hard breathing. Oh, maybe I'm just out of shape. That may be it. Chest pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Doesn't sound like something respiratory, right? Fevers, chills, weight loss, and anxiety. Again, would you go automatically go to a vape at that point? No, there's flus, COVID, that's a big thing. RSV, there's all these different illnesses that mimic this exact thing. So 
In order to rule it out, we do a lot of exclusions, we do a lot of data, and we do what's called a CT. Now this is cutting this person about right here, okay? Cutting them in half, we can see that the heart's right here, we can see the spine, and we can see these lungs. Now all those white things in there should not belong there. Those are what we call ground glass opacities, okay? All those white spots should not be there, and that's evidence that there is that lung injury. Those are not good spots. And what that means is that it's going to get really pricey and that there's going to be a consultation with lots of specialists, such as a pulmonologist, so that lung specialist. Medical toxicology, because that nicotine's in there, okay? And it doesn't have a short half-life. It's going to take a bit. Plus, all those heavy metals, remember that part? Yeah. Psychiatrists, because addiction, okay? It's going to we got to treat the whole person. We can't just treat part and be like, oh, you're good, go back out. No, you're going to return to that. We got to give you support. And same with infectious diseases, because a lot of times that injury is already there and there's going to be an infection along with it. Okay, so now we have two parts to, to worry about. Okay, so what should we do? Cessation. Stopping is the key. We always like to prevent things rather than treat them afterwards, right? It's a lot easier to prevent a heart attack than get them back after it's already done. Same thing, no different. It's a lot easier to be healthy than um, fix it after the fact of these injuries are already occurring. So what is this? It's a chance for change. We want change. We want to do better. We want to feel better. And we want our, we want our patients to do better, OK? But it doesn't just take a medical professional to do this, OK? It doesn't have to be myself, it doesn't have to be Anne. It could be anyone that can ask these questions and can start this process and get people to change. How to do that? We call them the five A's, okay? So ask every time you see him. You ready to quit that yet? That's a nasty habit, you ready? No, okay, I'll check back. Next time you see him, you ready to quit? They may get annoyed, but that's fine. Annoy them on this topic until they're ready to be like, oh, geez, I'll just give in. All right, that's what we want. You gotta tell them in a clear manner, you need to quit, this is not good for you. This is not good for you. And I'm guessing pretty much everyone sitting out here can say, I know someone that vaped, I saw someone on the street, I ran into them here or there, I've done it myself, I do it myself. Whatever it is, you probably know someone, right? That prevalence on that campus definitely shows that it's around here. Um, and then ask if they're ready to quit. If they're like, yep, I think I'm ready, that's great. Then we need to give them a, re a recommendation of how to do so, where to go. A great example is student health, okay, remember that. And then you can make sure they stay on track. So say, I will be your partner throughout this, I'm gonna assist you with anything I can through this, and I'm gonna check in on you frequently to make sure you're not regressing and going back to that addiction, okay? Give them that support. Most importantly, have them talk to their provider, or if you are vaping, talk to your provider, okay? We can do several things for you. There are certain medications we can give that cut down that craving um, so that you can take that on. Look at all those people who said, I tried and I failed. I tried and I failed, I tried and I failed. It never happened. Let us know, we can help. That's what our job is. Our job is there to help you. Sometimes it's lifestyle changes. Sometimes it's trying to replace a habit with another habit, maybe a good one instead. Um, maybe some people just need to carry it around with them for a while and have it be empty, but still have it there to hold. Um, we walk through all of that with you, absolutely. Um, I've seen several patients who we couldn't get anxiety under control until we got vaping to stop. And so there are different ways of doing that, blowing through a straw, holding on to a pen, Creating that shape, again, having something that is empty rather than full. And then monitoring. We need to make sure that we can get them back to that health, um, to that baseline data, take care of all those symptoms that I said. In order to do that, sometimes we have to check them out, make sure that their heart is doing well or that it returns to a normal pace. Um, so a little bit of monitoring is absolutely encouraged. Ultimately, we just want to get you, or whoever you know, back to the best version of you, um, and that's doing it in a healthy manner. So 
remember that as we don't do this to be mean, we don't do this to lead you down a wrong path, it's because we want you to feel better overall. What questions do you have at this time? Yeah. Does this research show that it's harder to quit vaping than cigarette smoking, or is there any research? So the main research right now on vaping as far as if it's harder to quit or not, it's not there because it's so new. However, I will say that there is data on people that choose to go to vaping for smoking cessation techniques. They switched over because they're like, this is a way to stop traditional smoking. And a lot of times, actually the majority of the time, they will become dual users. And so that means that they will use both cigarettes and vaping. Um, and that's kind of what they then get kind of stuck at, or they will always continue to vape. Um, there hasn't been too many, I mean, always there is a few that are successful with it, but the evidence shows that it's mainly gonna go to that mixed method. Great question. Any others, yeah. Are there some flavors of vape that are more dangerous than others? You know, that's, that's a very, very interesting thing. Those additives and going farther into those, there are a few of the preservatives or a few of the flavors that are a little bit more harmful that we find that value rate going up in. Um, one of the main additives is vitamin E acetate, and that one's been showing extra harmful and more damage with those lungs. So I would say more than likely, I would say yes. Good. Any others? It's going to affect athletic performance in several ways. Remember back to those, those symptoms I put on the board. It's going to change the way someone breathes. If someone has all of those ground glass opacities in those lungs, they are not taking their fullest breath, which means that their performance is initially going to change. Um, the nicotine binds to cells in different ways, and that can take away some of that oxygenation as well. Again creating a fatigue or an issue with performance. So when you have students come to student health and they present with maybe anxiety or they present with maybe call for breathing problems, do they ever, are they forthcoming about their vaping um, habits? Or does it take a while to kind of dig into what's contributing to their anxiety or their call or what have you? A lot of times that depends on the person. Um, if we have someone who's a little bit more of an open soul, they're usually pretty good at saying, hey, I do this, these are my habits, this is what I do. We try to screen everyone, but sometimes it doesn't always work. Um, but, you know, some, it takes a little bit to establish rapport, get them comfortable, start talking. Um, it'll be maybe a month later that we've been working on treatments and they're like, so I have to be real with you. I'm like, oh, here we go, okay, all right. But it's a great piece of information. So when they finally open up, it is amazing because then we can actually treat the problem rather than um, kind of jumping around to different things and sometimes not being successful with it. And that's that glass. The gl ground glass ground opacities. Glass. Yep. Um, how long does that stay in your lungs? It takes a while. Lungs take a good amount of time to heal. Um, and if it's to a point where it scars that lung tissue, if you are grown, will take even longer to heal because new growth or that tissue gets replaced over time, but a lot of time it's when people are growing. Um, not to mean that it's safer to use as younger, absolutely not, but it's just, it's gonna take a lot longer for that regeneration of tissue, and sometimes it'll stay there for life. Yeah. Are there any secondhand yes. cigarettes? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't understand why that happened per se. Absolutely. So in 2008, I believe, and it was implemented all by 2009, there was the Nebraska um, Indoor Smoking Act, something like that, Clean Air Act, I believe it was called, um, where it said people should not be smoking indoors due to that exposure of secondhand smoke. Um, because it was marketed as that harmless water vapor, a lot of people got into that habit of saying it's not going to do anything to the walls, not going to do anything to anyone around me. However, that's wrong. Remember, go back to all of those things that that aerosol produces, such as those trace um, trace metals, those heavy metals that are in there, those different different concentrations that's put into that aerosol. 
it goes out into the air too. So what doesn't stick in yours will stick in someone else's. So, um, and technically, if people go back to that Nebraska clean air law, vaping is supposed to be out of there as well. But again, it's not caught as often. Yeah. No, absolutely. There is a discrepancy in knowledge out there as far as vaping. And actually, when I started this project and started going through, there was not a single um, continuing education piece for medical providers on this topic as of yet. Um, so that was about six years ago, seven years ago, um, when I started this project. And there, at that time, there's no continuing education based on this. Um, a lot of providers at this point in time, they've had maybe a little exposure that is bad. Um, a lot can use their own clinical judgment and say something like that into the lungs is probably not good. But there's a huge discrepancy, especially with the general population, because our ads don't penetrate as well as that blue ad, right? Those go on TV, those go on posters. You see vape shops everywhere. But what you don't see is those on the other side saying, stop it, stop. And it's because of that lack of knowledge out there at this point in time. These are great questions. Yeah. Do you have similar presentations with this, but to improve THC using that for vapes? To a point, yes. Um, the problem with that is, again, that is one of the newer pieces of data that's come in within the last two, three years. And so some studies are still being continued at this point to get those results. So data is kind of up in the air. But the ones that are definitely finalizing, finishing up, those ones are all showing that it's a negative accumulation. What does it look like when you, well, Bill's question, when you're adding marijuana? Or the nicotine, what an overdose looks like. I know you said something about nicotine. Nicotinic overdose, yeah. About PC, but what does that look like? So a lot of times what it'll look like is like any other substance um, abuse, such as like <coughs> methamphetamine or um, um, cocaine, it'll be like the pinpoint pupils, so they're they're blacks and their eyes will be super tiny, um, like the point of a pin. Um, sometimes they will be unresponsive. Sometimes they will have that really racing heart rate because again, this is a stimulant. Um, sometimes passing out, vomiting, um, it kind of depends on the person. Um, and the kind of exposure, such as if it was an eye drop, ear drop, um, if it was overdosed by inhalation, whatever it may be, it varies. Yes. So they just thought it was candy. Yes. Kind of like. There are some liquid candies out there, and so it was mistaken for another version of it. Um, I believe the study was done in Oregon, and the majority were children. There were a couple geriatrics because of problems with eyesight, hence eye drops, um, or needing like an eardrop for like swimmer's ear or something like that, and it was mistaken and used instead. Um, so it's very, very interesting, those concentrations, as well as the marketing for it and what it has done with health and society. So students wanted to come to Student Health to talk to either you or Anne about their vaping or vaping any concerns, what that would look like, how you start them on a cessation program, what that would look like. So everything is individualized. It depends on what you use, um, how often you use it. It may be um, working on concentrations or just taking less puffs or shorter puffs. So it might be one of those um, therapies and techniques. And luckily, we have, not to call you out, so sorry, Laura Kate over here. Um, she works with us as a therapist, and she does a lot of implementation of things that will help short term. Um, which is awesome and a huge benefit to us. But we also go through different medications. Everything is different for each individual, but there are a couple out there, like one's Wellbutrin. Um, that one is for depression initially, but there's a smoking cessation piece to it. 
And I've successfully had people stop vaping on that medication, so that's been a good one to go. There's also been a lot of studies based on um, the medication, medication Chantix um, that have shown some positive results as well. So it depends on age, it depends on risk factors, um, all of that good stuff to help choose the right path for those quitting. But just being able to come in and say, hey, I wanna talk about this or see where my health is right now, that's a step in the right direction. As long as you trust us, we'll take it from there. I know this is about vaping, but curious about information or kind of similar on the nicotine levels for not necessarily chew where you have to spit it out, like the smells or like the nicotine pouches that people will just swallow rather than spit out. Do you know like how much nicotine is in there? Because I feel like I've noticed that more than vaping because they can then do that more easily inside or oh. like in class and we'll just have it consistently. That is a very good point. And no, I haven't gone that far in the research. I mainly focused on inhalants, but that is a very good insight. And I'd be curious to know too. Yeah. I don't know if you might have mentioned it already, but like, how long does it take for someone to become addicted uh, to vaping? That depends. That depends on a lot deals with the personality and if they have an addictive personality or not. Um, like one ingestion of it, I don't even want that personally because that's still damage to those lungs potentially. But as far as developing that habit or that dependence on it, that's going to change from person to person. Some are a lot easier than others. I'm curious, and I don't know if you can share this, but of all of the potential numbers that we have here at UK, what kind of numbers have you seen of people coming in to want to quit, needing help to quit? Way less than that. Um, I have been at UNK Student Health now. This is my third semester, um, and I think I've maybe had two my entire time being there that said I want to quit. Otherwise, it's usually taking a lot of prodding, a lot of questions, a lot of suggestions, a lot of those five A's to figure out where we were, and a lot still haven't gotten to the point of saying, yeah, I'm ready. Um, when I did um, my practice outside of here, I think the population was about similar. I think I only had maybe five or so in about two years that said, I'm ready to quit. Um, so those numbers are pretty reflective of what we're seeing here at Student Health, as well as those in general of just wanting to quit. Do you think that's correlated to the fact that people don't realize that? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and plus, there's a lot that see others doing it around here, and so it's kind of like um, I consider it as like the drinking nowadays is going to be that vaping aspect, whereas there was a lot of pressure when it was. Um, the 90s, 2000s to drink, a lot of times now that suggestion is more towards that vape side of things. And part of it is probably due to not knowing these complications out there. Yeah. And maybe this is for one reason. Why can't you ask if you've had a history of your vaping? We do. Okay. We do. So just, we do screen for that. And actually, that was part of my project. So you're just assuming they're just lying then? Some just don't want to tell you right off the bat. And it's so because of a trust issue. Sometimes, yes. Sometimes it's not really a straight out lie. It's more of a trust issue or it's more of a, I don't think this is a problem yet. I only do it once in a while, so it doesn't count type of incidents. Yeah. I'm curious, is there anything with the athletics, with our sports teams that, I mean, athletes vaping or? Absolutely. I mean, I was, I, I'm a lecturer and with, with all the COVID things, and I had to Zoom sometimes, and one girl zoomed in, and I don't think she realized her video was on, and she's vaping, and she was a soccer player, and I'm like, hmm, I don't, what do coaches do? I mean, do coaches, like, have rules against that? Or I'm just curious, does anybody know? You know, I probably can't speak to that. Who oh, can't speak? Uh, uh, is that all right for you to answer that question? So um, I'm the associate athletic director here in charge of sports medicine. Um, so our coaches are aware of this. That's why I asked about the THC presentation because we need to bring we need to bring awareness, way more awareness to our athletes um, in regards.
us the baby, but I wanted to get out of class if she could find the THC. Um, so they're not in favor of it, and we talk to them and try to educate them, but it's just like everything else. I mean, we also talk to them about alcohol and everything else, and then they go off on this weekend and they do their thing. But we do ask of them that history of those type of things and, and try to get that answer out of them right away. But um, I, do, I would agree with you. I think it's a problem. Um, I see most of the kids will come into sports medicine before they go to student health or see their team physician. And I would say this year I probably saw way more kids with some of the symptoms that you mentioned. And they're like, well, I don't understand this. So what's going on here? And you know, they don't have a fever, they don't have any respiratory, or, um, you know, they'll be vomiting, they don't understand why. Well, maybe because you're vaping. Maybe because you're smoking. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we, we, when I say we, I mean the athletic department in general, we got to we gotta get over that at home somehow. And that's partially why I came to listen to your students. Mm -hmm. To say, you know, if there's other ways to, to do that, but I mean, no. No brainer that our athletic population is no different than the student population, and maybe even a little bit more because they're active and athletes are typically risk takers. But I don't have any studies on that, so don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, with the rise of like things like Zans and nicotine pouches and vaping, I know that's kind of a prevalent thing nowadays. I was curious as to whether you thought nicotine, uh, just as a drug, was uh, likely to be a gateway drug to other things like, things like uh, marijuana. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, is it 100% linked or is certain that someone's going to change over? No. But again, it's a risk. And if they're willing to take one risk, what's stopping from one other? Um, if they're no longer receiving the benefits of a stimulant, such as nicotine, and they need something else, then what else? Um, just like caffeination. You can go down a slippery slope if you are not getting that need of caffeination, and it's not meeting your needs, you're going to find something else that will. Good. Great discussion. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you for attending today, and if you have any questions, let me know.